All right, here we go. Sit back, it's time to get groovy. Question, do you remember that movie? Welcome back to the podcast. I am the third Alejandro Rosa on IMDb, and I am your host. In this episode, we're going to talk about the 1995 film, Seven. As usual, if you haven't listened to this podcast before, please understand this is going to be full of spoilers. We are 100% spoiler episodes. So, this film, directed by David Fincher, came out in September 22nd, 1995. My guest to delve into this lighthearted romp is the amazing, the wonderful, Dave Black. Yay! Thank you for having me. <laughs> Very happy to be here and talk about this. Like you said, it's a maybe a rom-com, comedic romp at the very least. So Absolutely. I don't know why Julia Roberts wasn't in this one. <laughs> this cast. So for those of you who haven't heard this podcast before, this is uh, a podcast where our guest picks a film from their past that they enjoyed at that time, but they have not seen in years, usually 10 years or more. Mr. Dave Black, when was the last time you saw this film? That, that that's really a good question. I don't know. It's a movie I own. I own the DVD of it, which means I probably bought it when I was in high school. If I had to guess, that means I watched it last in college. So probably 15-ish years ago at best. At least 15 years. Perfect. That, that means all requirements for this podcast. Whew. Now... Before we talk about the movie, we have to talk about you for a second. First of all, just to give an idea, um, how would you describe Dave Black in less than 30 seconds? I, I, I have no idea. That's um, I, I can talk about what I do. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, we can do that. Sure. Let's, let's go with that. Okay. Um, so I'm a librarian. I'm an academic librarian, worked in university libraries. Right now I work at Mary Baldwin uh, University and... Other than that, I have two kids, a beautiful wife. I've played rugby for the past like 17 years or so. I like to cook. Yeah, librarian. I have a history degree, history master's degree, so I like history. What year do you think it was that you watched this film? That, that That's a good question because I, I recently rewatched it, obviously, yes. for the podcast. And I, I didn't actually know what year it came out. And... When I looked it up after watching it, I was like, I was eight years old when this film came out. There is no way I was watching this movie as an eight-year-old. Precocious though I may have been, I was not eight. So my guess is that I watched it sometime in high school. So sometime in the early 2000s, I was born in 1987. So I was probably 15, 16 years old when I watched the movie. One of the things... I used to do as a person who lived in like middle of nowhere, Western Pennsylvania was like every month or couple of months, my sister and I would drive to Walmart and we would buy movies from the bargain bin. We would buy DVDs. And I suspect this is one of the movies that I bought because I own it on DVD. I, don't know where it came from. Um, I don't think I had ever seen it before, uh, but that would definitely put it somewhere 2002, 2003-ish. Okay, that's kind of perfect. You say you were probably in your teens when you first watched this. So was I. However, because of a, <laughs> a mild age difference, I was a teenager when this movie came out. And so I did. I saw it in theaters. I remember because, wow. okay, that, that's a little hurtful. Um, because, don't make me feel old, um, because <laughs> Brad Pitt was like the it guy at that moment, right? We're talking Legends of the Fall, Interview with a Vampire, Post Thelma and Louise, uh, 12 Monkeys in there somewhere. I don't remember all the years of those films. All right together though in the mid 90s. They're all, like, right. I mean, that was his moment, uh, when he became a star. And so this movie was Right in there, right in the in the cusp of his greatness, uh, his newfound celebrity. But yes, I did see this in theaters. How would you describe this movie? What is this movie in a nutshell? I guess I would say that this movie is the police's search for a serial killer 
who bases his victims, his entire kind of, I don't know, what have you, his his mantra, his, you know, raisin deatra um, on the the Catholic seven deadly sins. So every person, every victim he picks is somebody who is guilty of one of the seven deadly sins. And I'm going to forget one when I go through these. Sloth, envy, gluttony, lust, greed, wrath, and pride. Ah, I, got I think them you all. got them all, yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so it's them trying to figure out who this serial killer is, how he's choosing his victims, what his purpose is, everything along those lines. Um, and it is just the search for this person. We have a recently transferred detective uh, named David Mills. And we have a retiring detective named William Somerset. David Mills, of course, is played by Brad Pitt. William Somerset is played by Morgan Freeman. Those are kind of our two main characters. We have a secondary role of Tracy Mills, played by Gwyneth Paltrow. And interestingly enough, Ronald Lee Ernie, famous for Full Leather Jacket, plays the police captain who does not have a name. I looked this up. He's actually listed as police captain. Oh, all right. Well... I recognized him and, yeah, did not even stop to consider the fact he didn't have a name. Neither did I, because I, I did when I was looking back. I'm like, what What did they call him? And then I, I looked it up. And, oh, they didn't, they didn't call him anything. So for those of you who don't know, David Fincher, very famous um, director. He directed a series of films that you may have heard of, everything from The Game, Fight Club, Zodiac, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, The Social Network, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, and Gone Girl. Why this movie? I, I said anything. You can pick anything you haven't seen in a thousand years. Why did you immediately think seven? So I, I didn't immediately think seven. I, I, I was tasked with pick a movie from your youth was kind of the, the thing that I went with. And I, it was hard for me because... I watched a lot of movies when I was younger. As I mentioned earlier, went to Walmart on a semi-regular basis, went to other stores and bought, you know, movies from the the five for ten dollars bin or whatever it whatever it was at that point. And so I, I owned a lot of movies. I gave a lot of them away because I would buy them, watch them once and give them away. But most of the movies that I liked that meant something to me that I really enjoyed when I was younger, for one reason or another, I watched since then. I'm very much of a, a person who enjoys revisiting old friends in the forms of books or movies or what have you. So it was it was really hard for me to find a movie that I was like, oh, I really, really liked this movie when I watched it. Um, haven't watched it for like 15 years. And this was perhaps, the, I mean, this was definitely the first movie that really crossed my mind that I was like, yes, that is a movie I remember really enjoying. I remember really liking a, a lot about that movie and I would like to see it again. So this, I think, gave me the opportunity to watch it again and to view it with new eyes and kind of all the things that I've, I don't know, seen and experienced in the past 15 plus years since I first or since I last watched it. So. Going to that, if you can remember, what was your impression of this movie when you first saw it, when you were a teenager? I mean, it's it's hard to get into the headspace of like 17, 18 year old uh, Dave Black at that point. Um, I was, I think, kind of a I'd like to think of myself as most teenagers do, kind of morose and misunderstood. And I think that movie encapsulates a lot of that. I mean, it's it's a very dark movie. Even rewatching it, I was like, damn, this is a dark movie. By the time I watched it, five, seven, whatever it was, years after it came out, it was very well known, very much of a cult classic, very well regarded. So I think I was kind of primed to like it, knowing those things about it. But I think on a, I don't know, deeper level i think it spoke to me in terms of and this is this is going to sound really weird to say but i liked kind of the religious ritualistic aspects of the killing because that is something i mean religion i was not raised catholic i did not know anything about the seven deadly sins i didn't know anything about that entire aspect of it but i think there was like a a degree of 
morality seems like a strong word, but there was a logic to the killings that I, I think appealed to me. Like there was kind of the, this religious backbone to everything that was going on. And I mean, these, even as I grew up, I mean, I was raised in a Lutheran household, went to church. I was an acolyte in the church. I was a reader in the church. I went on and I got my master's in history in thinking about religious history and intellectual history. And so like religious history has always been really important to me. And I love the ideas and the impact that religion can have on the way people think and act. And I think probably even at that relatively young and tender age that that really spoke to me, because uh, I think it's a very interesting aspect to the film. So that that's that's my guess. I, I really don't know. Like I said, it's very hard to kind of re-inhabit myself half a lifetime ago. Since I put you on the hot seat about that, I will tell you that I also tried to think back to my teenage self. I remember liking it, but again, I also was, like all of us, dark and morose and deep thinking and feeling and emotions feelings just just, just a yeah oh, oh a <laughs> waterfall of emotions yeah and i remember i was very fixated on brad pitt's character at the time and of course again he was like the it guy and somebody to look up to and um so i i, I found that very fascinating and of course i believe and i could be wrong folks because i meant to look this up for no reason except to be able to say it on the podcast <laughs> I believe this ended up being the Brad Gwyneth time. There was a time period when they were together to the point that they even got the same haircut. Um, so they looked like siblings. Um, Gross. There was a brief okay. period. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a weird time. Um, you know, the mid 90s. This film takes place in seven days. There's a lot of sevens in this. Seven days, seven deadly sins. I don't think I remembered the fact that the character of Somerset, played by Morgan Freeman, was retiring and had exactly one week left when the film starts. Something that this movie hits you with is the fact that it rains every single day. It's relentless. I did not catch that the first time I watched it. Did you catch that this time around? Um, yes. Definitely this time around, probably because I was thinking about it in a different way, but just the entire setting of the movie struck me in a very different way. Because at least as far as I know, as far as I observed, they don't actually mention at any point where this takes place. So the entire setting of the movie I'm just like, I don't know, it's dark, it's rainy, it's cloudy, it seems New York-esque. Is it New and York? Is it some dark corner of Seattle? Is that why it's raining all the time? Yeah, maybe. I uh, See, I don't know. I don't know. And then the last scene, or the last extended scene, however you want to look at it, they drive out away from the city, and it is this barren, empty landscape where it is not raining and it is sunny, but it is just like bleak and barren and there are like burned out trailers and broken down cars. And it really gives it a very post-apocalyptic feel in a way that I never noticed before. Like I never thought about the setting in that way um, because it always seemed, oh, they're in New York. But like when you go back and look at it with a more critical eye, it's just like, no, clearly they're not. They're not. Like there's no landscape that looks anything like that outside of New York. Like that's, that's not what New York State looks like. So um, just the fact that, yeah, in the city, rains all the time dismal place, depressing place. And then, you know, in, in the last couple of scenes when they leave, it's just like, oh, no, it's it's totally different than what you were expecting. Um, it, it does almost have like a Judge Dread Mega City One type feel to it because <laughs> it's like, no, they're in the bleak outside apocalyptic landscape. It, it's 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 very, I think, effective when you when you stop to think about it when you stop to look at it which i did not at all as you know when i was 17 or whatever i that was totally over my head i looked this up because i i tried to find something about this because i the rain really stuck out to me and i went this is intentional 
He's making it rain every single damn day. And not just rain, just torrential yes. downpour, like really pouring rain, not a late sprinkle. Like everyone's wet. Have you noticed yeah. that half the time everyone's wet because they're, they've all come out of the rain. Even when they do a press conference, the rain is behind all the reporters and they're all carrying umbrellas. So I, I read about this. The rain, the crowded streets, this was all intentional. Apparently, this was part of creating a world that mirrored the moral decay of its inhabitants. Something that Fincher is known for is for his use of color, sometimes using like green tones, gray tones, and just the way the color is mixed in the film. He also doesn't like bright lights, I read, on actors. He said it, it makes the skin not look natural. It's just, it's, it's beautifully, it's very artistic when you look at it from just the, the lens of like how beautiful horrible it looks <laughs> okay like this is not a pretty film folks but when you watch it as a film you're like gosh they really took their time to make a very particular kind of style to the film what do you think about our two lead characters you have the young ambitious kind of hard-headed guy you have the older leaving all of this behind kind of guy i, I thought it made for an interesting duality what, what did you think about when you look at Mills and Somerset? Yeah, I, that was one of those things that really struck me when I watched it now versus when I watched it however many years ago, because I don't know that I thought much or that I was attuned to kind of relationships between characters in the same way that I am now, because, I mean, it was fairly glaring in a lot of ways because you had this... You know, Brad Pitt, he's fresh out of whatever he's fresh out of. Like, I mean, they, they don't really talk about it. They say um, he transferred, he, but they don't actually tell us where they yeah, transferred they, from. They just moved to this unknown city from somewhere else. Yeah, he's transferred. Morgan Freeman keeps saying like, oh, or Somerset, whatever, however you want to. He keeps saying like, oh, this can't be his first case. And he's like, it's not my first case. But for the purposes of the film, it is. I mean, he's this young, energetic, like, go get him you know, kind of kind of a pain in the ass character. And Morgan Freeman is this much more, he's calm, he's cool, he's collected, he's much older, he's, you know, you have, you know, first day on the job, first day of the last week on the job characters. And I, I think that the dynamic between them, the fact that they don't understand each other, they don't see each other in this in the right way. I mean, they're Brad Pitt's very much like, I'm here because I want to like do something. I want to make a difference. And Morgan Freeman's just like, I, I'm done. I want out. This is too much. It's it's I'm done. Yeah, the the relationship between them, I think, was like I said, something I, I think I very much missed. Um, but I think it's very crucial to the film because they balance each other out in so many ways. And I think that applies to the entire theme of the film, like you know, the, the cardinal sins and the cardinal virtues, uh, just that Brad Pitt is, he's very, he's young, he's hot headed, he's energetic, he's all emotion. His home is, he's got this young wife and he's got this train that rackets through every now and again and kind of disturbs the peace and throws everything off. And Morgan Freeman is, He's alone. He has no family. He listens to a metronome when he goes to sleep. Like it is very calm, cold and logical. And I, I honestly, I feel like that was something I completely missed when I watched it the first time, um, but is so obviously essential to the film, mm -hmm. um, which I, I uh, thought was pretty interesting that I was just like, oh, no, wow, how did I miss this? And, well, you were a dumbass. You were, <laughs> you were 17. Exactly. You know, I'll tell you something. The, the difference between seeing the film as a teenager and seeing it now, when I saw it as a teenager, I'm not going to lie. I thought the, the, main, the main character was Brad Pitt. I, I yeah, thought, you know, sure. this is a Brad Pitt movie. Oh, and, uh, and Morgan Freeman just happens to be here. Right. Cool guy from Shawshank. Almost as like the magical Negro. Like when I first went into it, I was like, oh, is that his role? Like he is the guy. He's like, you think even when I was thinking about it from the seven, I was like, oh, is he the, the Virgil S kind of guide to Brad Pitt? And so like, no, 
no, that's not it at all. Like, that's not. He's not a trope at all. He is absolutely the main character. Yes, and I totally miss that. Watching it this time, I was like, this movie's mostly about Morgan Freeman. Like, I know that they have, you know, Brad Pitt has a lot of screen time, but really, the person carrying the film is Morgan Freeman and his interactions with this world and with David Mills. And even with Tracy, who plays David's wife, she catches on that they are struggling as new partners. She, out of the blue, calls Somerset and invites him over. And probably my favorite thing that, again, notice now and did not notice then, Somerset comes to the door and she says, he has not told me what your first name is, right? Because officers tend to, to talk to each other by last name, according to this film. And he tells her, my name is William, and then she turns and says, this is David. Like, get to know each other as human beings. And I thought that was so moving and so interesting and it completely lost on me the first time I watched this movie. I was just like, oh, cool, there's with Gwyneth Paltrow. 100% agree. I actually, I wrote down because I took notes while mm -hmm. I watched it. I was like, because I want to remember some of the things. Um, I wrote down, like, Gwyneth Paltrow, Tracy as the bridge between the two as humans because they had not related to each other on that level at all. Like there, there was no discussion about who they were, what they did, their lives whatsoever. Um, and she really does bring them together as human beings, which is, is a pivotal moment. The next scene, they have dinner and then... David Mills and William Somerset are together thinking about the case, solving the case. They or start not working solving. together for real. Like they actually, yes. they're actually, I noticed like suddenly they are working as a team for the first time. And they're yep. like going back and forth with their observations about what could be and not be. I will say my favorite part of that scene though was when Brad Pitt was like, Do you want a beer? And he was like, Ah, oh, wine actually. And he goes and he gets a. Uh, he gets like a water glass and <laughs> fills it with wine and brings it to him because it's just so it really exemplifies the difference between them. He was like, you want a beer? And he was like, oh, wine, actually. And he was like, I don't I don't okay. I don't know what to do with this request. And so he fills a water glass with wine and brings it to him. And later in the scene, Morgan Freeman, like, picks it up and kind of looks at it and takes yep. a sip. <laughs> But 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 it, it almost doesn't matter. It's like, yes, there is this fundamental difference between them. There are two very, very different people, but they have come together over this case as a result of Tracy's interference seems like a very strong word, but mm -hmm. like her, her impact, her yeah. mediator. Yes. Yes. Right. She she's the mediator between the two of them. Before this scene, before we actually have them connect as people, there was another scene that stood out to me, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on it. When they are not working together, they're not seeing eye to eye, and actually Somerset doesn't even want the case because he wants to just be done with everything, but he starts working on the case anyway. And you see two completely different approaches to studying this case. David goes home, cracks open a beer, puts on a basketball game, and it's just staring at the files, right? Reviewing the files, looking at the pictures. Somerset goes to the library, something that he clearly does all the time because the security guards are playing poker and they know him. Um, and they reference the fact that he's going to miss them when he retires. And he just goes through the stacks and he starts picking up things in reference to the deadly sins. Starts picking up books, Dante's Inferno, if I'm not mistaken, Canterbury Tales. Like, this is a well-read man. And he just sits there calmly reading and taking notes, which again, I thought about you as a librarian going, yes, that's where <laughs> the answers are. They're in the stacks. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that was a really, and I think the, uh, the, the wonderful follow up to that entire scene is the fact that Somerset Morgan Freeman approaches him and like gives him the note, like you should check out these books. And he does. And then he quickly, uh, Brad Pitt quickly throws up his hands and has a junior officer go and fetch him the Cliff Notes version of all of the stuff that he's supposed to read um, because he just he, he can't. I mean, it's it's not in his nature. It's not in his character. But, yeah, I mean, I thought that was a very 
excellent scene exemplifying the difference between the two of them. Just that Brad Pitt's character is so focused on the crime, on the scene, on the people, on everything that's going on sort of in the here and now. He doesn't have... I don't want to admit the capacity maybe to focus on kind of the deeper impact of everything. Whereas Morgan Freeman is definitely, he's the researcher. He's like, no, there's, there's a lot going on here that we are not seeing that we don't know about that. We can't learn about from the crime scene photos. I do think it does a great job setting up kind of how they're going to be good partners in terms of like, you know, Morgan Freeman's less concerned about what has actually happened and more concerned about understanding the very nature of the crimes and the underlying motivations. Whereas, you know, I think as a young detective trying to prove himself, Brad Pitt's like, no, we need to solve this. Like what's going on? There is evidence here at the scene that we definitely are missing. It's two very different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So we can't continue on without speaking about the other most important character in this film, which is seldom seen until the very end. And that is Jonathan Doe, aka John Doe, whose name we never learn. It's so interesting that this character is in the film the entire time, but we, the audience, are never led on to who he is, except for one brief moment when they finally figure out where he lives. And they do it by doing something that probably affected you personally, abusing the powers of the library. <laughs> How did you feel when you saw a library being violated in such a way? I was, what, 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 exact, what are you referring to exactly? Sure, so Somerset pretty much figures out he's looking up these books which means that the killer must have looked up these books. So he probably has a library card. This is pre-Amazon. This is, you know, whatever. People are going to the library. So he's probably checking these same books out. And he has a friend. He has a friend in the FBI. The stinky FBI agent. That's right. As Brad Pitt calls him. <laughs> and Somerset explains that a while back, the FBI started kind of, they created a system. So if people start checking out questionable books, they kind of get flagged. And so he was going to use that to see if he could figure out somebody who was checking out these books. None of this seems very uh, legit or legal, which is why they're doing this uh, under the cover of like a very cloak and dagger kind of situation. And it is. And what he does is he, he has the guy do the search in whatever system that is questionably legal at the time and finds someone by the name of Jonathan Doe who has definitely been checking out these books. And that actually leads them to the killer's apartment where they discover plenty of evidence, but they still don't know who he is. They almost get the killer, but he gets away. What'd you think about that abuse of library privileges there? Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, it, it, I think it's, it's actually very funny looking back from like, you know, 2022, looking back on the mid nineties and like, oh, the FBI might be able to do this. And it's just like, yeah, sure. Yeah, they might. Thinking about everything that has happened since then, the idea that the FBI would maintain a database of people checking out random books from the library. If, if you were talking about maybe the 1960s or 1970s, I'd be like, yeah, maybe. But even in the 1990s, the fact that I mean, so many people had library cards and everybody's checking out, like just the vast swell of humanity and how many people are into weird stuff. I mean, I think just like the number of people who are into true crime, like if you're just like, oh, no, we keep track of who listens to true crime podcasts in 2022. It's just like, yeah, do you? Great. That's <laughs> like, you know, however many millions of people. I don't know. I, I, I guess. From a realism standpoint, that seems utterly ridiculous. I mean, even in the mid 90s, that seems utterly ridiculous that they'd be able to be like, no, no, we tracked this person. They checked out Canterbury Tales and Dante and like these seven other books about, you know, what happened, the seven deadly sins. And, you know, I guess there, there's a there, like, the librarian part of me is just like, 
nah, you, you shouldn't be doing that. Like, whatever. <laughs> like, what people read, it's their own business. It's right. their own thing. You can't deny somebody access to a book based upon your own prejudices. You know, I, I feel like the library list that Jonathan Doe checked out, I feel like I could have checked out. I mean, I've read <laughs> Canterbury Tales. I've read Dante. I've read, like, it's. it seems a little ri- ridiculous, and yeah, it, it seems like a violation. <laughs> um, so I, I do not believe that the FBI would be capable of doing that, nor do I believe that I would be very happy if I found out that they legitimately kept a database of everybody who has checked out, like, these are the 500 books that we need to look out for. Absolutely. Um, or even a database of, like, these are the books that everybody has checked out from the New York Public Library. That does not... <laughs> doesn't sit well with me. I figured it didn't, but I, I had to ask, we had to address it. I felt like it was the elephant in the room. One of the things that this film is known for is the twist. The twist, which they refer to in, as, you know, act three of the film, which is they're hunting for Jonathan Doe, and then Jonathan Doe appears and turns himself in. At this point, five of the deadly sins have been found, And he just walks into the police station and goes, it's me. Here I am. Even even rewatching it, it was still very fascinating. And then you have what we talked about. We have the famous scene, the most famous scene in this movie, I think, which is the end scene where the killer says, I have two more victims for the two other deadly sins, and I will take you to them. But you have to go with me in a car and we will go do this. What was it like watching that scene again and that whole kind of twist to it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think obviously watching it back, I knew it was coming. I expected it, but it is still it's still so sudden. I think because the, that entire I mean, I guess you'd probably call it the second act of the film is just like almost relentless. Like you spend so much time with the first murder, so much time with the second murder and then, like, the next two is just, like, they're going to the crime scenes. They're seeing things. They don't really know what's going on. I mean, there, I guess there is the, the part where they go to his apartment and see things. But it, it doesn't really amount to anything. No. Like, they're just like, what do we know? Nothing. He's nope. independently wealthy. He's crazy. That's what we got. Despite the fact that they found him, they found his apartment— They're left with absolutely nothing. And they're still, you know, in the process of discussing the case, like, what are we going to do next? How are we going to approach this? Whatever. And he literally just walks into the station. And it's even rewatching it. It's just like jarring because you've watched this whole build up and like an hour worth of like these three cases and then like two cases just like that. And then it's just like, oh, no, there he is. he's, He's just there. And it is it is very remarkable, like the way he called. He's like detectives, you know, and just lays down on the floor and fingertips wrapped in bandages, just walks in and is clearly like, nope, that's the guy. Like we got him. But then there's this whole, you know, another half hour or so to the movie where nothing that you would have ever expected starts to happen. Exactly, and that's what they always point to as. This is when this movie stops being like any other movie, like any procedural or anything like that, and becomes something weirder. And I think it's so interesting. You know, they have him in a car. They have this whole conversation. You know, they have him, et cetera. They end up talking about good and evil. And then, like you said, we leave the city for the first time. And then we're in that looks like a barren wasteland. And all of a sudden... A delivery truck shows up and Somerset and Mills separate. Mills stays with John Doe. Somerset goes to stop the van, gets the package, pulls out his switchblade and opens the package. And Somerset realizes they are not in control. And John Doe has all the power right now. And we get to the most famous line in this entire film, what's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? You know, I won't lie. They've made fun of that scene for so many years on so many different things. Yeah, it's cliched. But he is so good. It is so powerful rewatching it. What did you think about that last scene? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I had forgotten how after he opens the box and looks at it and has his initial reaction, 
he says to the helicopter something like, you know, stay back. John Doe has the upper hand here. And Brad Pitt, he acts the shit out of that scene. I mean, just ridiculous, which is something I have always said about Brad Pitt. Like during that heyday, during when he was making, you know, all those movies in the early 90s, he was such a phenomenal actor. And I almost feel like he never got his due because everyone's like, oh, he's so handsome. It's yeah. just like, yeah, great. He's he's a wonderfully handsome man. He's also just this freaking phenomenal actor. And you believe it. I mean, you believe the anguish. You believe the uncertainty. You believe his just reacting to what Kevin Spacey is saying in that moment with Morgan Freeman running across this deserted landscape being like, no, don't, don't talk, like, stop, stop talking to him. Like, my number one takeaway from the whole movie was how impressed I was at what a good movie it really is. Yes. That's one of those things that the passage of time or whatever is like, oh, yeah, you know, it's a cultural icon, whatever. I liked it when I was half my age. Like, oh, it must be really good. Like, if you like it when you're 16, it's probably a really good movie. It's like, no, I liked a lot of shit when I was 16. <laughs> That's terrible. But I was like, no, this is a well-crafted, well acted well written movie just across the board and i think that that final scene really drives it home because they they just do a phenomenal job all of them i mean all three of them i know it's not super kosher in 2022 to be like oh kevin spacey like oh what a great job no no he was a phenomenal actor no I, you know I, yeah not getting into that can of worms, but one of the most horrible things about the whole situation was the fact that some of us were great admirers of his acting. Yeah. And so... Because he, I mean, he was. He yeah. was really fantastic. Brilliant. I mean, you cannot Absolutely take that brilliant. away from him. Nope. And, and we don't. We just want to take everything else away from him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for the safety of others. One thing that I found fascinating, and I can't finish this episode without pointing this out, that final scene is the most famous scene in this movie, and it was the biggest issue with making this movie. Andrew Kevin Walker wrote a script that New Line Cinema bought. In that original script, we had the what's in the box scene. The film ends in the original script with the gunshot. There is nothing after that. New Line Cinema said, absolutely not. We are not going to do that. Please rewrite this. And they did, or he did. David Fincher had directed 50-some music videos with everyone from Michael Jackson to Billy Idol to Madonna and had decided to go into film, and he stepped in to direct Alien 3, which is a very, it was a very chaotic thing. The studio was really involved. A lot of people didn't like it. He actually says, nobody hates that movie more than I do. After that, he was like, no, nah, I ain't making movies anymore. I'm going to go back to ma making videos and commercials and whatever. For like a year, he didn't read a single movie script. And he came across this script with one caveat. New Line accidentally sent him the original script. Huh. And he was like, I love it. I want to make that movie. I love this movie. And they were like, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, we don't, not, not this movie. No, 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 no. Like, we, we have a different version. He goes, I don't want that version. I want this one. And he ended up meeting with, like, the head of production and... The head of production really wanted him, so it was like, okay, we'll let you do it. But one of the producers on the film was like, absolutely not. There was a lot of fighting about this. They were like, no, let's have the dog head be in there. Let's have something else be in there. Remember, because David has dogs. Right, yeah, um, yeah, two dogs or whatever. The second script didn't have any of this. It was actually like a more like an action movie sequence where they track down John Doe and get him. And David Fincher was like, absolutely not, absolutely not. The writer, of course, fought for the ending, and David Fincher fought for the ending, and Brad Pitt stepped in and said, I want this to be the way this movie is, or I walk. And then Brad Pitt said, I was in another movie called Legends of the Fall, and we had a very powerful, emotional ending, and it tested poorly with audiences, so they changed it. I don't want to see this movie have to do that. I don't want that. This movie is great the way it is. And he threatened to, to walk. Eventually they did it. By the way, the producer who totally was like anti this scene in the 2015 Entertainment Weekly thing, he's like, oh, I changed my mind. It's a beautiful, it's a wonderful, yeah. Of course, of course. you did. Yeah, Could it be because shocking. it's one of the most famous scenes yeah. of the 90s? Could it be that the movie 
cost like $33 million to make and you guys made $327 million out of it? No, you should have made it safer and gentler and just <laughs> exactly. Like... And it's like this, this whole thing about how they weren't going to do it. In fact, the film ends with Somerset seeing David kind of be driven away in a cop car and he quotes Hemingway. That was David Fincher placating the studio to kind of cushion the ending. So it wasn't just bang, end of movie. He added it. They like I think that was their like happy medium. Okay. Like, okay. I can have everything else. The other thing that he promised was that we would never see what was in the box. Okay. And so audience members think that they've seen what was in the box. Right. Right? Because but yeah, you never actually do. What you see is Somerset's reaction. Because even at the end of the film, he's the only one who saw what was in the box, right? Um, but yes, one of the most famous things in this film, a billion times they tried to cut it. Okay, question. Does this movie hold up? Oh, absolutely. Like, I mean, like I said, I, I think this is actually a fantastic movie. Um, not even just colored by my own remembering it when I was young and vulnerable and whatever else. I, I think it's really a fantastic film. I think they do a great job. I mean, yes, it has violence and yes, it's it's not exactly an enjoyable movie, but I do think it's just, it's super well crafted. It's super well written. It's super well acted. This This was better than I remembered it being. So absolutely, I think it holds up and... It's funny that you say that about the ending because I, I thought that the whole whatever the the last scene of the movie is, I think where they have, you know, David Mills in the cop car like being taken off and he's sort of semi catatonic, and Morgan Freeman's like, ah, oh, I'll be around, was a, a kind of meaningful to the movie itself because he had spent the whole movie. Just being like, I'm done, I'm out, I'm leaving, I'm going to have like a farm, a garden, I'm going to have a house, like I'm going to move to the country, I'm going to whatever. And, you know, then you have this scene at the end of the movie where it's, again, raining and dismal and awful. And he's like, ah, nope, I'm going to be here. Like, what the hell else am I going to do? The beginning of the movie was supposed to have a scene showing Somerset in a house in the country outside of the city. Uh. and you see him kind of organizing or whatever, and then he drives into the city and it gets a dismal, and you get that. And that was originally in the script, but they ran out of, like, time and money. So huh. they were just like, because they were really trying to work off of, it was only $33 million, which seems like a lot to most of us, but in film, I guess not. So they had to skip it. They're like, no, we don't have time, we don't have the money, we have to go. So that kind of makes sense. Because remember, there is a line where he says... Like, I'll be on the farm or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's the the cat, the unnamed police captain is like, what are you going to do when he retires? He's like, I don't know. I'll be on the farm. I'll be have, taking care of the house. I'll be raising chickens. I don't, I don't remember what he says, but it's something yeah. very bucolic, like, yeah. this is going to be my life. And we would have known what the heck that meant if they had shot the first scene. I don't know. I feel like, to me, it works again with that last scene. Where it's like, sure, he has these pipe dreams of what it's going to be like once he retires in seven days, but we don't see it. He doesn't see it. He doesn't actually know what it's going to be like. I feel like it fits the character in a lot of ways because he he is just this cold, well, he, he's not really, but he does come off as this cold, measuring, logical, like, I'm done, I'm over it sort of person. But, you know, I think because of his interactions with um, David Mills, he really comes to see people and care about people again. Um, and it really does seem to draw him back into the world of policing in a way that I, th I think fits because he is, I don't know, it seems strange to me to talk about him like, oh, no, the, this real character and that. But you know, um, yeah, he, he was definitely tuned out and he was brought back into the world um, and started to care about people a lot more. Um, so I, I kind of like that he doesn't have a life outside of the dismal rainy city. Just dreams of the life. No, real exactly. Life. Yeah. It's it's an un, it's a pipe dream and he doesn't know what it really would be like. 
there is no way to end this on a happier note than that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this, uh, Dave. I really Thank appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for making me watch this movie. Um, it was better than I remembered. And that was awesome. And thank you so much. Thank you for taking me on that journey. Yeah, I was agreed. a little concerned. Um, better than I remembered. So. Yes, better than we remembered. <laughs> so if you haven't watched this movie and you listen to this podcast, sorry for the spoilers, but still go watch it because it's great. It's actually, uh, it's on Netflix. So Netflix, I think it was on Netflix. I don't know, I own the DVD. Like I said, That's I right. bought it when I was in high school, so. I think it's on, it's on one of the streaming services for free right now, because that's how I found it. So just Google seven and go watch it, uh, or watch it again, really watch it again and yeah, really pay attention. It. It's a total rewatch. All right, well, thank you so much, Dave. Thank you so much for taking this time to hang out with me this evening. Absolutely. We will do this again. Sit back, it's time to get groovy. Question, do you remember that movie?